Are you ready? Okay. Thanks everyone for joining us. Today we're meeting with Dr. Bob Mendelson, who's a practicing clinical psychologist on, in Long Island, New York, and he's also a professor at the doctoral program of clinical psychology at Adelphi University in Garden City, New York. Uh, we're going to be talking to him today about COVID and psychotherapy, and some which ties into some of the other stuff on our channel. So to start off, uh, Bob, I wanted to kind of get your general take on what was the change like to switching to a more, you know, telehealth format during the beginning of the pandemic and how that changed the, the psychotherapeutic process? Yeah, and um, you know, um, it was very difficult for many, many clinicians. Uh, I, I uh, supervise and have trained many. It was not difficult for me because uh, for a number of years I was doing supervision uh, from with people who were living in other states. And so I, I was used to the Zoom before that FaceTime and then Zoom process. Uh, although I, I will say that um, over, you know, it, it, particularly at the very beginning, session after session after session after class on Zoom, my back hurt, mm -hmm. uh, my neck hurt. And, you know, I, I didn't realize till after a meeting how tense I was. Usually, uh, you know, in person, I could move this way, I could move that way, but I was pretty focused on the camera. But for me, it was, I know for many people, it was culture shock and, and, and very difficult. Um, for me, it offered opportunities. For instance, I, I worked with them. Um, a couple of physicians had some meetings with them where they were in scrubs, uh, I guess it's called that, in there mm -hmm. uh, and in hospital and didn't want to go home until they talked to me. This is the height of the COVID where they were mm -hmm. had been in other specialties and were assigned to COVID boards and were seeing things that one could only imagine, you know, uh, people see. Uh, have seen during the, during COVID, mm -hmm. um, but so uh, that's a long winded uh, answer. But um, I understand from many, including people in my family who are who are therapists, uh, how difficult the the medium is and the switch over. Um, was there? I know for a lot of clinicians at the beginning of the pandemic, <clears throat> there was a bit of a shock because unlike nor your normal work where you see a caseload and each patient is talking about very different things, suddenly the sessions felt like they were blending together and one patient after another is talking about the same things, especially working in one yes. geography, you have a wave yes. going up in New York. Down. Well, this, that's, actually, that's actually right, but there's also another variable that uh, I don't know that it gets talked about. Um, one can have a, re a respectful emotional distance when you're talking to somebody with a very different experience of trauma, mm -hmm. what about when we're talking about this and I'm scared to walk in the street and I'm afraid to be in a closed room before we knew a lot of what was happening and before the, the vaccinations, uh, I shared some of the same terrors. So it's a, a bit harder to be objective and to be emotionally distant. And I don't mean unempathic, I mean empathic. But, uh, but uh, not having this, well, this isn't happening to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, so uh, I, I think it, it, was, uh, it, it was difficult for everyone. It was difficult for clinicians and all healers. Uh, I'm not sure if this concept was available before a pan uh, uh, pandemic, but there's a concept called moral injury, which is... Um, particularly relevant for the, the position I was describing of uh, people who are healers and helpers and had to make a decision about who lives and who dies. And what do you do with that kind of, of guilt and sense of responsibility? It goes against, you know, our, our basic, you know, understanding of, of what we do as helpers. So um, I, I don't know if I was rambling, but uh, um, we not only, clinicians not only heard the same theme for e from each patient or client. Uh, I, I was trained in the 1960s. I use the word patient. For me, clients are people who go to lawyers. I know that's mm -hmm. not, you know, whatever. But uh, hearing from each patient uh, stuff that triggered stuff in me 
took me a while to begin to feel comfortable. Um, uh, and, and I noticed with some of my dream life and whatever that a patient would trigger something I would then dream about, you know, mm -hmm. or have a, a memory about her, you know, or whatever. That's really interesting you mentioned that. It sounds like you're really tapping into clinician burnout as well um, and having to go through this where you're working through the situation simultaneously with the patient. Yeah. Um, I guess I was wondering what sort of advice might you have for clinicians in training um, or for others uh, going through this path in terms of things they can do to help manage that sort of uh, burnout and stress. Um, okay. well, stress and burnout are two different things. Right. I actually never experienced burnout. Okay. And uh, I may be really so different from your sample. I've been doing this uh, 50 years and been through, you know, uh, uh, the end of the Vietnam War, uh, Korean War, Iraq, uh, and Afghanistan wars. And these are tra these are also traumas. People died, and uh, you know, and uh, they were traumas that had less personal effect because I wasn't, you know, called to the front, uh, you know. But um, but a, a number of my colleagues did experience burnout. I know I'm sounding like off the curb uh, curve. Uh, 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 I use work to stay meaningful my, for my life to be meaningful, and. Uh, so I actually finished a book. Uh, here's a plug. Uh, it's called a Freudian Thought for the for the Contemporary Clinician, and it's about a course you guys took uh, on, on Freud. It was a transcribed uh, uh, Freud lectures. Can they be relevant today? So I finished a book and started a, a, another during uh, the pandemic. But to deal with burnout, I mean, there are two levels of burnout for students. I remember seeing my first patients or clients and I would see one or two sessions and then have to sleep the rest of the afternoon. It was exhausting. Mm -hmm. I think that part of that is time, yeah. that you, you begin to learn how to use uh, the, the certain coping skills and uh, you know, like intellectualization and uh, reasoning and uh, sublimation. And you know, it, for me, during this period of time, my writing, increased, there was much less to do, like not many places ago. My reading increased, my writing increased. I think for, for, for students, as I said to you in the, in the doctoral program, uh, it was particularly distressing with you wearing masks and not being able to see each other mm -hmm. because what clinicians need is other clinicians as friends. Mm -hmm. You share a certain, I mean, sound dramatic you share a calling and there are people you're you can be very close to who are just not going to understand the kinds of uh, meaningful experience that you're going to have that you can't share with them so I, I you know one of the things that was very distressing to me with your class and class before you uh, about the pandemic was after your classes which now are on zoom after your classes would be prior to this People would walk together and have a cup of coffee, uh, you know, uh, uh, and sit and talk and process. So that is one way. Certainly, I, I uh, have recently gone back to something I don't know if you've heard of it called the gym. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that has been amazing for me to yeah. start to, you know, have some time alone and, you know, get my begin to get my body back into some shape and having some quiet time and uh, some, you know, and uh, close relationships. Um, so, but I think some of, uh, this is an odd choice of phrase, but some of, for student, some of the burnout comes from not having developed, using the metaphor of the gym, enough muscle memory. Mm -hmm. You need to work and work and do more work and see more people. And then it becomes, it's never easy. I mean, even after 50 years of work, I'll finish a session. And then a person leaves, or, or it's on Zoom, I turn off the machine and I'm teary. So, you know, it, it, the power of what we do never changes, but our way to adapt changes. And I, I can't say enough about friendships with people in the profession. Mm -hmm.
I was wondering, have you seen the pandemic affect your, um, I think one of the things that we all had in common during that period was the sort of loss of social support in some form. Um, so how have you seen the pandemic like altered your own views on how it impacted your perspective on treatment and sort of that connection that you're referring to? Right. To it, 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 it was very hard to tell people who were already because of their own personality issues, isolated yeah. to suggest to do what we just talked about here. A man who's very phobic before the pandemic, very phobic, frightened of germs and illness. And he said, can you imagine what it's like for me now? And I couldn't. So to say to him, meet a friend for coffee, uh, that wasn't, right. it was unlikely, you know? Uh, so, um, that, I mean, if I, I was reading something from APA, uh, you know, before you guys got here, because I thought, I saw it, I thought it looked interesting. 140,000 children have lost a, a, a parent or a caretaker in the U.S. since this. Uh, 100,000 people have died of overdoses. Mm -hmm. um, in many parts of the country, uh, a child brought for mental health care, it takes four months to get an appointment. This would be inconceivable with a cancer diagnosis. And yet uh, that kind of isolation is occurring just in, even just in terms of healthcare, forgetting, you know, forgetting what is that a symptom of? It's a symptom of, and I don't know if you've done something which I've started to do again called driving mm -hmm. a car. Do you see how people are driving? I don't know if you've noticed. They're driving like they've been let out of a cage and they're in, enraged, mm -hmm. cutting you off and driving, you know, tailgating. And I think the culture is just exploding, you know, with all this pent up frustration. Frustration leads to aggression. It's one of the things we know about, uh, you know, from um, it's going with a kind of elementary psych frustration. Leads to aggression. There's been a lot of frustration. So did, I, did that answer your question? Because yes, I thought to, oh, good. It definitely does. Thank you. So something that brought up that that brought up for me was um, like in reading some of the literature, we were seeing that um, a lot of the experiences of like prejudice, of violence um, for like disadvantaged groups. Yes. Um, or marginalized groups is really, I mean, it's stuff that's been present the whole time, but was really exacerbated it's during exacerbated. the pandemic. That's and right. For people also who aren't in those communities, um, it was really like on center stage because there was that time to kind of see it and was being presented a lot more. Not that it wasn't there before, but right. that. So one of the things that I'm wondering is like how, if at all that came up in your sessions and how also being a part of that and seeing like, you know, having this presented to you and it just being in like, I guess bombarded with it in some kinds of ways as well, like how that. Um, it raises a very complicated, a series of complicated yeah. issues because um, uh, at, at my level of training and experience, I'm going to more likely see somebody who's wealthy. Mm -hmm. And I have the other problem, the opposite problem of dealing with somebody who is wealthy and filled with hate and misunderstanding of, mm. of impoverished people and uh, who, is, who was already filled with kind of a magical thinking about the world because, you know, when we regress, we regress to childlike ways of thinking. Uh, if you hear some of the conspiracy theories that went on in politics mm -hmm. uh, during uh, presidential campaigns, this is, a, a, this is a bunch of regressed children in make-believe land. So I had to deal with, uh, I'll get to your question specifically in a minute. I had to deal with people who were saying outrageous and morally repugnant things to me and who deserved to be helped, but it was, that was going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had one man who was severely traumatized and a, uh, a arch conservative. And um, some of the things he said, and he knew who I was. And he would say, I know this is hard for you to hear, but, and he'd repeat something back. And I had to think about how traumatized he was as a child. Because in, in my belief, people who are the most uh, angry and uh, bigoted 
are people who have suffered very severe trauma and are looking for an explanation and finding an other to be angry at and say that's their fault is a very simple, incorrect, but simple explanation. Mm. We call it in the trade splitting. You know, I'm all good. This minority is all bad. And they're the reason that we're having all the, these, pro, et cetera, et cetera. I had to work very hard to remind myself of how man, this man was suffering. Mm -hmm. And one man in particular had a, a very, well, several, had a very powerful experience. I may have mentioned this to your class. It was very powerful at the time. Mm -hmm. A man had the, had the injection, vaccination, first vaccination. And after the first vaccination, he broke into sobs, which I couldn't understand. And then I realized he was feeling relief, but the relief gave him the ability to say something he had never said or thought before. He said, I now know what the pandemic is. The pandemic is my childhood. When I was a child, if I made noise and my father was home and he was drunk, he could beat me. So the air was filled with horrible, dangerous things, pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 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 so if you're, if you have that, you're severely traumatized, you're going to other, you're going to look for somebody else to blame instead of your own history or your own uh, uh, anger, you're going to look for somebody else. And, and, and was that your question? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it was a different take on that question, which is actually interesting to see as well, um, because uh, you gave the perspective of the other person um, where you saw their experiences, their early experiences and how it tied into the sort of trauma that was occurring in the moment. Um, and so, the bigotry. Yeah. Right. Now, in terms of my supervision, that's very different. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, supervising here, you know, over the years, many, many uh, clinicians who work with people who are traumatized and otherized. I don't know if this is such a phrase, and 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 uh, 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 are, and, and that's where you get. And this is a very unfortunate thing. It's going to be on YouTube. I might want to take it back. We can um, edit anything that. The, the greatest predictor. In that case, come forward more. Of, of how, how one would fare in life. And I've said this to you in, in classes, is level of education. Below high school education is predictive of, of poor nutrition, poor access to health care, more likely to be a victim of a traumatic family um, and uh, full level of employment, you know, less than. And these are people who were already in trouble and then the pandemic just made things worse. So uh, 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 there, you want to look at how the current pandemic has exacerbated severe trauma that was already there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's difficult but doable. Uh, what we look for in, in, uh, as a psychodynamic therapist, I look for um, correlating the current uh, problems with historical trauma. Uh, the problem with the word trauma, like the word depression or resistance or uh, any of these words, is it gets overused. <laughs> Except that I don't, I've never met anybody, including everybody in this room, including myself, who hasn't suffered some trauma in life. Question is degree of trauma and then what sources of support were available to the person at the time of trauma. But yeah. so if you, uh, you uh, using the model I used about somebody whose family uh, never finished high school, who are in low level jobs, who are um, othered because of their uh, race or, or uh, you know, religion, whatever, uh, and um, is now facing all of the other stresses with the pandemic. 
this is a very difficult situation. And uh, <laughs> that's what. <laughs> so it sounds like you kind of give us like both sides. So like in your experience, like with your clients that you get like a taste of like the people who are doing the othering and who, yes. and, and talking about how, like you said about establishing control and uncontrollable circumstances and how that leads to aggression. You saw a little bit of how on like a micro level, this is happening like at a much larger scale. And then in right. supervision, you're seeing like the people who are being affected by that othering, by that aggression, by that almost displacement. Of, it, it, is that kind of like in the ballpark? It's exactly what I said. I was ready to remark with something funny. I'm taking Travis wherever I go so he can translate for me. That's exactly what I was saying. Yeah, I, I think I had like just two, two like quick follow-ups. Like um, when, when you are trying to like also empathize and like understand, like you can, yes, take this person's perspective and like see. Well, I can be sympathetic yeah. to that perspective. I can't take that yeah. perspective sympathetic to their perspective like what where does the work kind of go from there like how do you kind of do you do you try to like address that like in in, in kind of like because one of the things that we're talking about like in our class is how clinicians go about addressing prejudice with their clients and how right. there's this conflict between maintaining the therapeutic relationship but also like this moral obligation of benefic benefits benefits yeah. yeah um to like protect society and like those kinds of yeah things. well I I, I I fortunately have never been in the position where I thought somebody was prepared to do something terrible to <laughs> society that would be a dilemma for me yeah but uh, but but certainly with somebody who is bigoted it doesn't take very long for them to know me um you know what you see is what you get pretty much with me and uh, the, 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 the man I was talking about said, I know what you think. Uh, this is my feelings, and I know what you think, and I know in advance, I'm not going to sway you, but, and then he would point out something, and if it was ridiculous enough, I'd say, let's say his name was uh, Roger. Roger, let's go through this bit by bit, and if I did a little bit, he might either get triggered and angry because he didn't want to go any further, or he would say, okay, okay, I see your point. So, that's about as much as I could do, given, given, you know, my primary obligation is he comes up with some, you know, some very serious problems that I have to help him with. Um, I, uh, what I do personally, forgetting about what I say uh, in this instance to the person, to the, to the patient, is I look for something about the man that I, this man, that I feel is decent. And there were enough things about this guy that made he in particular a very decent person. Mm -hmm. And I had to do that in other words, it, 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 so that I wasn't going to just feel uh, lost in my, uh, you know, criticisms of him. Uh, now, had I uh, worked with somebody who was uh, planning to storm the Capitol, I don't know, that would have been a, a, I guess somebody has to work with such people. I, that would have been very easy for me. Yeah. Uh, um, I guess on the side of the patients, we, we noticed some, some discussion around people either developing routines that were very new to them or hobbies that were new to them and not becoming an important part of their identities, or people having sort of surprising identity or personality changes that resulted from the pandemic. Can you speak to either of those? those? You mean people who I've worked with? Yeah, so patients... This obviously have the pandemic having like a, a serious personal impact on them and bringing them into themselves in a way that something good came, uh, another uh, hobby. Or, Ideally uh, good, yeah, but but not necessarily. I see. Yeah. Um, um, I didn't see that. I did see, um, I did have the uh, experience I've had in the past uh, where um, particularly people who I've worked with who went on into medicine, people contacted me and I thought the metaphor was they were calling to see if I was alive. Mm. Um, but uh, people who came back, not to see me, but to check in or to have a session. And it, it centered around uh, either they want to know if I was okay, which is, sounds a little egocentric, or they were, uh, they were um, 
also something about the pandemic had triggered what had happened in the work with us. Uh, and it, it, it typically it was a couple of meetings and um, that was enough. Um, I, 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 I think I'm unusual in that, um, not that the pandemic didn't take a very big toll on me. It, you know, it cost me two years and I'm old. So I wasn't, uh, nobody can afford to lose two years, but it was particularly distressing to me. I did write a book and, and complete it and, and work on another. So I got myself involved in something that would, you know, that would keep me feeling, my work makes me feel a, a sense of meaning and purpose. And that's why uh, I'm almost 80 and I'm, I'm still um, 80 years old and I'm still uh, working. So, uh, you know, I fell back on defenses and uh, personality traits that have worked for me. Uh, but um, uh, I, I, I don't, I, I think that changing personality is a very, very big process. It means that uh, there's been a lifetime of certain kinds of coping me mechanisms, which we actually call defenses, although it, it has a, a very different meaning to the lay public. Uh, you know, the kinds of defenses that one would use uh, as a young child, which is, you know, you, if something's upsetting you, you don't want it to bother you, you close your eyes and go to sleep. Uh, in adults, we do some version of that phone rings and it's bad news and you say, oh no. In that split second, we've regressed back to uh, closing our eyes and making believe something isn't there. Um, and, um, you know, we're talking about the very troubled people with, who had make believe and whatever, they're going back to magic, you know, thinking in, in terms of magic. Uh, but uh, I did see people who were thrown for a loop mm -hmm. by, the, by the pandemic and trying to find uh, mechanisms that worked. Uh, the, the pandemic, because of all of the social isolation, the worst thing it did was keep people away from other people. And, uh, you know, humans need others. And that kind of, particularly people who didn't have lots of resources, uh, has been, uh, you know, we're going to see the effects of that for 10, 15 years, at minimum, I think, we're going to see the effects of that kind of the isolation and the prolonged terror. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and similar to Gaff's point um, in that vein of potentially like surprising personality traits that might develop um, or mechanisms of coping. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to speak to uh, situations in which you might have seen somebody in person within that very confined therapeutic setting and then have to transition that to a remote setting in which you actually get to see the sort of space that they're in uh, yeah. um, and the environment that they're used to. Um, and have you had the opposite experience of that? Where yeah, kind of I, I have had both. Then transition. Yeah. What was I had, I had the, the, someone I started with in person and then we moved to Zoom. And then I had somebody recently as the world has opened up a bit who I saw on Zoom first and then they, I saw them, uh, it was a couple and uh, actually two couples. And then I saw them in person. Uh, I found with the first, where we went from in person to Zoom, it was a bit more confining, even though I was looking at them in their place where they live. I did not, it, 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 it was something more freeing. Now, I, 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 it may be them or me or a combination. Uh, I felt they were more inhibited on Zoom. Oh. And so I felt these people were harder to reach and I had the exact same experience with people I started on Zoom. And it was a couple and one of the members of the couple was so closed up and then when they, uh, they showed up uh, in person, I'm gonna try to be careful and not say which gender person, but the one member of the couple who had been very closed up was now a very different person. It was mm -hmm. sort of shocking. I think it was the human contact with, with me um, where the person felt safer around their mate. I don't mean safe from violence. I mean safe emotionally. 
around their main tent, you know, and that made a, a very big difference. So I, I you know, I started the, this uh, whole conversation saying that I didn't see a difference in the work, and I overall I didn't because I'd been doing some of it before the pandemic. But in certain instances, it, it was different, sometimes subtle and sometimes not. I mean, nothing's better than human contact, the real deal. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. It sounds like you both I shifted gained. during this meeting. Uh, right. <laughs> this meeting was Sarah therapeutic. I learned uh -huh. something about, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you gained something from just like having yeah. that in-person human experience, but simultaneously you're able to also uh, get the sort of convenience to be able to still speak to people over a uh, telehealth setting. Yes. Um, rather than not. Um, yes. So, pros and cons. That's good to know. I'm also wondering, like, while like there wasn't really a change that you saw, like necessarily in the work initially, maybe there's some. Um, like, did I think just the pandemic as a whole like change the way that you kind of view like your own identity and how? if that also kind of came, put, came up into the way that you practice? I, I, my, my sense in the pandemic was I, did, I had been in denial about everybody dies. And uh, you know, we had here uh, uh, our dean and passed away, our, our uh, dean before you got here. Jean Chin and her husband, who was, she was Dean, passed away. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm a little arrogant about my life. You know, I work out at the gym and whatever, I'm old. So I did think about, you know, that um, we're not here forever. Actually helped me to finish with this one book and start another <laughs> legacy. And, uh, you know, uh, during the pandemic, we, um, my wife and I uh, had our, one of my daughters and son-in-law and uh, grandchildren stay with us for over 100 days. And that was pretty amazing in terms of the, the my age to uh, the time of five and three-year-old and now seven and uh, turning seven Saturdays, seven and, uh, and, and four. So uh, it, it has, it, I'm sure it will have profound effects on me in terms of, you know, what is life? We should, I know this is going to sound corny, should appreciate it every day. Uh, so I think, I think we're ready to wrap up. Um, thanks so much for speaking with us, Dr. Mendelssohn. And is there anything that we left out or that you'd, that you'd like to mention either about the topic of COVID or just about that, that the audience should know about you? Uh, I, I'm not sure the audience would want to know much about me besides this, but I want to say this, except that, uh, as you all know, I was a rock and roll musician before I uh, did this and, you know, worked with famous groups. And so it makes me a bit of a performer. I want to say that uh, these people are the example of why I come to school and work. Uh, they make me very proud to, to be, uh, to do this. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and for doing this. Yeah.